and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 84, No Touching, Games That Reduce or Eliminate Contact. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Yeah, though we obviously don't get the show started right away, sometimes we do a little warm-up at the beginning to give time for people to show up. Tonight's one of those nights. Uh, tonight should have been an AMA. We apologize. Usually the last Wednesday of every month, we do an AMA and ask us everything, anything, everything, whatever, ask us questions live on the show, but you know what? With everything going on in the world, we completely forgot. Plus, we've had some urgent questions go on that are a little more based on current events. So we thought we'd dive into those. And what that is, is I've been getting a bunch of questions on what games might exist that limit the possibility of transferring things. So games with very little physical interaction between the players, where they don't need to be close to each other, or there's little to no shared components or cards or anything being passed around. Now, in addition to that, I've got a review of the 8-bit box from ELO, and I got a play of Woodlands from Ravensburger. That'll be in our Bellhops Tabletop segment in the second half of the show. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I'm everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. So, up first, a comment from Phil Hatfield about our house rules episode i don't mind house rules either in rpgs or in board games it is important though to let people know which if any mm -hmm. house rules house rules you are using i do house rules in a number of board games if i play with others i always make a point of explaining why i use particular house rules and explain the regular rules and why the house rules rules are utilized i use house rules with roll through the ages the bronze age by doing just one die roll a turn. Hmm. The reason is because we played it wrong for a month or so before <laughs> realizing the mistake and playing it by the rules. And we disliked the game when we played it by the rules. So we went back to the way we'd done it from the beginning. I also house rule Lewis and Clark by not allowing people to play people and helpers and collect absolutely nothing. It doesn't make sem thematic sense to send someone to go hunting and send a helper along and not have them actually hunt at all. It also stops gaming the mechanics of the game by wasting cards to avoid penalties, while at the same time not taking resources, which could delay you as well. I hate when people game the mechanics of a game. I've also house-ruled Starfleet Battles, so it plays more quickly. <laughs> I'm also currently working on house rules for XCOM the game and Dinosaur Island, the former to remove the need for the app, and the latter to allow for variances in the dinosaurs. Wow, thanks for the extensive comment, Phil. Uh, one thing I gotta say, you said he doesn't like house rules much. It sort of kind of sounds to me like Phil likes house rules, or at least making his own. Uh, the main important thing that he said there that I think really nailed it on the head was the first thing he said right at the beginning, and that is communication, letting people know. You don't want to sit down and start playing anything and then have someone at the table be like, oh, wait, no, sorry, we don't play it that way. I also love the fact that he actually explains why the house rules are there. So here's where the original rules are. Here's what we changed, and here's why we changed it. That's really cool. All right. So Jim Hayden seems to have found our Race for the Galaxy re-review. They took the time to comment to say, thanks for that. I found it really interesting to read. It's a good idea to look back at classics that you still enjoy and rethink just why we do. Plus, thumbs up for talking about the expansions. Personally, I only got the game two years ago and have been really enjoying the base set, even though I've got the first two expansions but not played them yet. Mm -hmm. Building up to it. Cheers. Well, thanks for the comment, Jim. 
I love the fact that people continue to discover stuff in our backlog and the, even on the older stuff on the blog, the older articles. It's always interesting to see what's getting hits and what's not. As for Race for the Galaxy, I strongly suggest, Jim, that you get Gathering Storm into the mix as soon as possible. It's the one expansion for Race I think is a must-own and a must-use. Now, the rest of them, totally up to you. 100% optional. Toss them in, take them out, doesn't matter. But personally, I won't play Race for the Galaxy without Gathering Storm unless I happen to be teaching a new player. But if that new player already knows games, I'm even going to throw it in for that. All right, well, back to House Rules with Stuntman, who writes... I generally do not like house rules. I think some of the house rules came about because people misunderstood the rules of the game. I do recall when I first started playing Monopoly, I was just taught by other people. Then one day I decided to read the rules. I was really young and had difficulty with some of the terminology like mortgage. I didn't finish reading as my comprehension was not high enough to understand all of the business terms. I've more recently understood how wrong I have played all along. Hmm. I have made house rules on games that I did not like before. I house rules Star Trek Starship Tactical Combat Simulator to add some Starfleet Battles field rules to the game. It made the game more interesting and made it worth putting up shields. Mm. Just doesn't seem right when you play a Star Trek game and choose not to put power to shields on some ships because it's a waste of power. My friend and I made house rules for zombies because we mm. just hated the game. We never played it again, even with the house rules we came up with. It was interesting that some people house rules open money in Power Grid. I did not realize hidden money was to stop AP. Mm -hmm. Am I replacing it? I am replacing it with chips. I prefer hidden money because when you have auctions, hidden money makes it difficult to know how much you think you can outbid opponents or push them to spend more. Mm -hmm. I would use some type of shield to hide the poker chips. I have the deluxe version and the small plastic, plastic tokens for money are easy to hide, mm -hmm. are hard to stack, and easily slip out of your hands. Stacking chips help you count your own money so you can easily know how much you have. I do a lot of analysis with my own money, regardless of whether or not it's hidden from others. Chips make it easier for me to analyze mm -hmm. my own money more than bills. Well, thanks for the detailed comments, Stuntman. We got some long ones this week. That's pretty good. Twice in one night, we got uh, Starfleet Battles coming up, too. Now, I own Star Trek Three, the tactical combat simulator. I got that. Uh, going back, I ran a game of Star Trek, the FASA version, like in modern times, not when I was a kid, not in the 80s. Even Sean came down at the time he was in an Etobicoke, came down to play it. And it was so good that I rushed out to get the new deluxe second edition box set that came with those rules. Now, unfortunately, we never played again. So I've heard that the Star Trek Three tactical combat simulator is like a big deal. And some people love it. And there's a big, um, I don't know, war is a bad term, but clicks that some people prefer Starfleet Battle, some people prefer the comp simulator. But I haven't actually sat down. But I got to say, not having shields, not being able to put energy to shields just sounds wrong in a Star Trek game. Like, to me, that that's almost a core. Like, it's the first thing they say, like, red alert, energy to shields. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure how that's how every encounter starts. And thank you for telling us about your other house rules. All right, well, another comment on an older topic of gaming with kids. John Reher, uh, Reher, Reher, sorry, sorry about the pronunciation there, John. Uh, I got my grandniece and nephew a copy of my first Carcassonne, and they loved it. So they're on a good start. Well, thanks, John. My kids loved that game when they were younger. It is a really solid early kids board game. Uh, they've now since moved on as they got older, but you know what? They were playing with that one constantly, and it was one of the few they could play without parents around. It was simple enough for them to pick up and still fun. Well, continuing with the Gaming with Kids topic, Seth has some cooperative suggestions. Hello, and thank you for this list. I may run a couple of these ideas past the other half. Here at our place, we have a couple of favorites that our little ones can play pretty easily. Karat Attack from... Jekko, De Jekko is a really simple pirate-themed card game. It's cheap, very portable, and even offers some light strategy. Acrobat from Janod is a tower game that can be played cooperatively, build the biggest tower, or competitively try and make the game difficult for the others. It's got fun little pieces and is very colorful. Both of these games are pretty fast and can be, can be played by kids as young as four. Well, thanks for the game suggestion, Seth. Uh, these two games I've never actually heard of myself. I don't remember ever seeing them in stores. They're not ones we saw when we were shopping for our kids. But they do both seem to be available. I jumped on Amazon. They were both there. 
I gotta say, looking at them, Acrobat in particular looks really cool. It looks like a lighter version of a popular uh, dexterity game, an older one called Via Paletti. And it looks very similar to that, but a kid's version with these acrobats where you stack them up and there's multiple layers. Looks very neat. All right, well, we'll be sure to put links of both of these games in the show notes. Next, we've got a comment from Levi Moat, the designer of Horizons on our Extermination Expansion review. Levi writes, Playtesters told us one of the reasons they avoided 4X games was the Extermination mm -hmm. Axis. We wanted to package the main game without that axis for those players and add the option as an expansion for those who enjoy extermination. Well, thanks for the comment, Levi. Um, I said this last time I was talking about Levi. I love how awesome it is when a game designer actually takes the time to check out things like reviews put out by content creators like us. And even better, when they actually comment and interact with us about those, about those reviews and what we put out, which is pretty awesome. So th thumbs up just for that, Levi. What's interesting about this and Levi's note from both the, the um, play testers is I saw it. Like I saw it in real life. I saw it happen. So when we introduced Horizons to Ian at the CG realm, like Sean was even there. It was the last time he was down, we were playing it. Ian took right to the game and loved it. And except for the problem he was having, he couldn't sit for too long and had other things to do. He would have played two, three times right then in a row and asked me, please bring it back next event. So a month later, I brought it back and we sat down and this time we had a five player game. And we start playing and I had thrown extermination into the mix and wow, he did not like it. Well, at least the Viliox alien part. He was all for the new sons, thought that was great. Loved the new starter allies, but man, he hated the Viliox PVP abilities. Like right away he started and he got a defensive card. And then as soon as one player attacked another player, he just went on a vengeance. And he's like, I'm not enjoying this. This isn't as fun. I feel like I have to tiptoe around now and I, I don't know what to do. I, he basically said, feel free to bring this out. I'll play again. But if you put those Viliox cards, don't even ask me to play. So, wow. Like, like that, there was such that strong a reaction. Like it was that big. I do say, though, personally, I still think it should have been in the main box. I think the cards should have been in there. And then just have a section in the rule book that says, if you don't like 4X, don't use these five cards. If you like Extermination, use it. So I get it. You got to make money. I get the whole selling expansion packs. But I would have rather had it in there and take it out rather than add it if I want it. I, I think part of the problem might be a lot of gamers feel like if they buy the box, the game in a box, it all has they to be played. To Whereas if it's an expansion, you can take it or leave it uh, on a per game basis. But yeah. that core box, it's always got to be there. And that and that I can see how there are some gamers out there who could, who might take that. Yeah, maybe package them separate. Maybe that's the secret. Like put a little separate pack yep. <laughs> and label it 4X pack or something, but still put it in the box. All right. Well, I, I, that's, a, yep. that's a personal pet peeve of mine. I, I hate buying incomplete games where it's just very obvious that this should have been in there, was part of it and got pulled out. It's interesting to note it is the designer that did this. It wasn't like the publisher took his design and split something off. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get. I This week, we've got a package so dang big, it can block out the sun. I am going to open later tonight. So tonight, we're talking about games that either reduce or eliminate uh, cross-contamination, basically. Um, games where you're not sharing components and you don't have to be right next to each other, basically. Now, I admit, I had a rough, rougher time than I expected finding games for this list. Like, when someone first asked me this question, there were a couple that came to mind right away. I was like, oh, yeah, this, this, and this. No problem. There's some great suggestions. And I put those out to those people that brought it up. But then I'm like, oh, I'm going to do a whole blog post about this. We're going to talk about it on the show. And man, I was like, there's got to be more. It just kept feeling like, like I've, I've got a pretty good list. We'll get to that when we get to the next segment. But it just felt like I was missing. Like, I don't. it feels like I'm missing a genre of games or something. And I'm just totally not getting it. Well, except for RPGs. RPGs, we don't talk about this. So these are both board games. RPGs, of course, would be the whole genre of games where you don't have to share anything. And you guys <laughs> can be across the world with video conferencing software. So, yes, I missed RPGs, but that was intentional. So what I would love today is anything I missed from the chat. Like if, if you folk have some ideas on games where you don't share the bits, we'll get into more details by what we need. 
I would love to hear them. Like I saw there's already one really terrible suggestion in the chat, but that's the only one I've seen so far. Yeah. We are not allowed to play Twister. No. Twi <laughs> Twister would be the exact opposite of what we are supposed to be playing. And yeah. no pie face or um, what's a, the, the one with the stupid mouth thing that makes you spit everywhere. Oh. Uh, or, or, any of the, mouth. or any of the booger related games, which you yes. shouldn't play anyway. Uh, well, yeah. Or toilet related games, which again, you shouldn't play anyway. Um, don't step on it. We're all stepping on the same poop. That's probably a bad yeah. one. I don't know. Uh, now, one thing we're not going to discuss in this uh, is additional ways to play board games. That like uh, so, Vorpal board would be the the most recent example I can think of. These are digital tele presence rigs. Um, that's not what we're talking about in this yeah. episode. We're talking about people in the same house who are locked in a room together or locked in a building together but are still trying to isolate some. Uh, my, my, st uh, my case in particular, uh, my wife's a nurse, and we have to isolate from her, but we're all living in the same, same house. So. You probably should have saved that fact for the main topic. You could do better there. Well, you I have to repeat probably, that one. Yeah, it, huh? might get, it might get mentioned during the yeah, or two. That, that probably should get mentioned because that's a good one. Because I've, no, well, I've got my was... I've got my section I I filled in at the bottom there. Okay, so. I, uh, to be honest, I hadn't I, I read bits of what you had updated, but then I yeah. went and got offline for a little bit there. Uh, so the other thing is we're talking about this today, uh, based on current events. But I also want this to be evergreen content for just a normal day right or a, a normal event and you're going out to cg realm and you're playing with your friends and you know what ian has a cold and he's the store owner and he's got to be there because he's not sick enough to stay home but and he wants to do demos he wants to be involved like here's some ideas so ian can show off some games still right like stuff like that i was, I was trying to i didn't want to just focus on the the crap we're all going through right now yep all right well we're not uh, we're not seeing too much now, but you guys in the chat room have something to think about, so Folk. we'll get back to you. Oh, yes, Folk in the chat room. Folk in the chat room. Have, the uh, chat room. Yep. Sorry. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to you guys after the main topic. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com where you can click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, I will admit the best way is to go to the website. That way we don't lose track of it. We don't miss anything. It gets I get a nice big notification on my phone and on my PC. But you know what? Ask a question anywhere, in person, uh, Messenger, send me a text, catch me on Facebook, Twitter, me, we, Diaspora, WT Social, wherever you want. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere as we continue to deal with the global COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, much of the world, if not officially locked down and ordered to remain home, are encouraged to remain isolated for the protection of everyone. Now, since this whole thing started, I have gotten a lot of game recommendation questions, especially surrounding this whole stay at home initiative. We covered one part of this last week where we talked about games that are great for playing when you're stuck at home for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. We talked about epically long games, legacy games, campaign games, and games with high replayability. Now, from that, another interesting question popped up in a couple different places asked by a few different people. Now, if it's just one person who asked, I probably just would have left it as it was and talked to them. For one, Jeff Seuss on our Discord channel mentioned it. And then we also had a couple people on Twitter come up with the uh, a similar question, like reworded different, but people who were looking for the same thing. What people are looking for are games where there was little physical contact. Games where you don't need to pass playing pieces or share components. Games where you don't even need to be sitting together at the same table and can keep your distance. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So games with little to no contact required, as well as some gaming hacks you can apply to games that exist that normally would have contact, but that you can do a few things to reduce the physical interaction during those games. Now, before we do get to the recommendations, I do want to mention something. With what's going on right now in the world today with this pandemic, do not take these as suggestions on ways to get out there and get gaming and go out to the public and go to your local game store or have your game group over. That is not what this is meant to be. 
These are meant to be suggestions for safe ways you can get together with your game group in person. And you're not supposed to be going to the local gaming cafe. Yeah, these are suggestions for how you can play with the people you are already bunkered down with and ways and present a way to reduce or present any cross contamination in your own home. Yeah. Now, once this pandemic is over, this list also should be a good list for people who have, say, a simple cold so they can still game with their friends while reducing the risk of passing that on, or a way for germaphobes to enjoy a hobby they may have avoided, or a way for people to be a little safer when they game with each other. Yeah, with most board games, almost everyone touches everything. Yes. Now, I gotta admit, at least for me, before I sat down and actually started thinking about this, you just didn't realize how honestly unsanitary the average board game is. Because in most tabletop games, there are a lot of components. you got meeple and cubes and cards and dice and the board and the miniatures and everything else. And almost all of them are touched by everyone at the table or passed around or handed to each other. Like, just think about how many people touch a single card in Euchre, how often that, that, that left bower gets passed around, or how often that wood has been traded for sheep in your game of Catan. Or like we pass the dice to the next player and we hand it to them. Or another player asks another person, hey, can you move my guy because I can't reach? Only then on your turn, you move your guy a couple turns later. And then how often has that Monopoly money sitting on free parking been handled? Well, first off, there shouldn't be any money on free parking, but we covered that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yes, we did. Now, I'm not trying to gross anyone else out here. Like, th that's not the point. But it is something I think people should try to be aware of. And I think nowadays with what's going on, people are more aware of it. Just make sure everyone's practicing good hygiene and diligent hand washing. That should be enough to mitigate any problems by normal, in nor on a normal day. And it's like just sharing a game on a normal event, a normal night, and, and normal use. But there's a huge sanitation aspect to public health information right now. But this actually shouldn't be new information to people. We may mm. need to wash our hands more often in times like this. But how we wash them shouldn't actually need to be different. You should always wash your hands properly when you wash them. Yeah, there's a really good video going around there with some black ink and some gloves that, uh, that I've been sharing quite a bit myself recently because it, it's eye-opening to people who don't know better. So passing things around and everyone using shared resources and everyone using the same dice and passing cards back and forth is really common in gaming. It isn't ubiquitous, though. Not every game has these aspects. Not every game has it. So what we're going to talk about are some games that either eliminate the sharing of resources or at least reduce it or make it limited so there's a little less physical contact and interaction. We can start with something along the lines of bring your own game pieces with Magic the Gathering. Yes, so this was the first one that popped into my head. And I was just thinking about the fact that back in the 90s, when I played Magic heavily, every player had their own deck of cards. And you don't touch anyone else's cards. Heck, that people got upset if you touched their cards. Except for the fact that technically in the rules, the opponent's allowed to cut your deck. Take that out of there. You've got a game where everything's self-contained. Everything's your own. You're going to use your cards. Your opponent's going to use their cards. There's no distinct reason you need to be right face-to-face -face near each other. Uh, now, I do realize nowadays with Magic, there are tokens and plus one counters and stuff like that. As long as everyone's got their own and you're not sharing from the supply, I think it's a perfect game for being able to play with someone else where you don't actually have to touch anything the other people are touching. And then the nice part is the, the, the you don't need close proximity. Like, you can play it online as long as you trust each other not to stack the deck or something silly. The only problem with that, though, is you're going to have to probably know all the cards, or at least you're going to have to take time reading off your cards to your opponent. Like, oh, I just played a rat swarm. This is what it does. It's a 1-1 one, one swamp blocker. I'm totally making up magic cards now, so. Yeah, this was admittedly easier back when the total number of cards was something knowable by a single person. Yeah. Nowadays, it's a bit trickier because you simply can't know all of the cards your opponent mm -hmm. may, might play. Uh, my online play on Arena has been, you know, every time I go up against somebody else online, they play a card I've never seen before yeah. every time. Um, and uh, when you're playing in arena, that's easy because you can just hold mouse over it, but it's a little harder if you're playing with real yeah. decks. 
Uh, but if you just take your time and talk with each other, there we go. And that was Magic the Gathering. I bet you there's people out there that know every card. <laughs> I think Probably. I've seen some of them on yeah. Friday nights. <laughs> All right, I specifically called out Magic the Gathering because it's the most popular collectible card game out there, but pretty much all of the CCGs, all of the card games out there, all of these two-player dueling deck construction games work. Uh, the thing is make sure everyone has their own version of the additional components, right? So, like, I, I don't, I haven't played it in years, but my kids got into Pokemon for a while, and there's a coin that needs to be flipped in Pokemon pretty often. Well, you just make sure you each have your own coin. And there's damage tokens. Well, you each have your own supply of damage tokens, and you put your own tokens on your own your own pocket monsters. Uh, even, like, Ashes, Dawn of the Phoenix board, which is a really neat dice-based collectible, or not even non-collectible, but dueling card game. As long as you each have your own set of dice and your own tokens and everything. Uh, the other one I thought of was Keyforge, but then I realized it's actually a bad one because Keyforge, there's an awful lot of giving people your cards or taking from them. I noticed the, the few times we played Keyforge, we, both me and Sean dove into that game and it died off, sputtered out pretty quickly. But I remember there was an awful lot of, oh, here's your alien. I put this under here and I take this from you and I get your top card off your deck. So may not be the best choice because of that. Uh, Pokemon, especially, I know when, when I was playing that with my kids, we all had our own things and we never, yeah. never touched each other as you played on your own little game surface and went to it. Those were other, some other dueling card games. All right. I got one more. It's a specific one and I could have probably included it with the other ones. It's Sorcerer, which is another dueling card game, but it has a lot of board game elements. So that's why I kept it out separate. And I realized, as I was talking about other dueling card games, there is a problem in Sorcerer. There is one of the lineages that powers up by taking other people's cards, the Arthropod Followers. So don't, as long as you don't use that faction. Now, the trick here, and the reason I wanted to put this one first, because we're going to get into this with other games later, is it's a game with a board. But as long as you just have one player do all the stuff on the board, you remove that level of interaction or that, that level of contact. Because, yes, there's going to be three locations, but as long as one player tracks the damage on those and at the start of each round tells you where, like, hey, I want my guy at that one. And just one person does all the, the interaction with those. Now, again, you're going to want your own stuff. So you're going to need your own omen tokens. You're going to need your own set of dice. That way, nothing needs to be shared. Now, White Wizard actually sells these all separate. You can get a Sorcerer dice set. You can get additional tokens. But having two core sets is probably the safest way to play because that way you're not sharing anything because otherwise at the beginning you're going to be somehow going to have to divvy out the cards between the two players. Which, again, if you have to do that, just make sure you proper proper hygiene, go wash your hands before you start playing. But two core sets is definitely the safest way to play Sorcerer. And there's a good chance that if you're a fan of the game, you'd have bought your own core set anyways. True enough. <laughs> So that was Sorcerer. All right. The second game that came to my mind after Magic the Gathering was Werewolf or Mafia uh, or any of the other versions of that. These are those social deduction games which only really require players to talk to one another. And you don't really have to be close together. You could easily be two meters apart while playing Werewolf or Mafia. Now, if you've got a big group, you're going to take up a lot of room, but so what? You just basically need a large enough place to fit everyone and you're good. Now, the problem is, is the selecting of roles. So there's a couple things you can do. Normally you use a standard deck of cards or you can use a, a themed werewolf mafia set. So one, you can make sure those were clean before you start so that the person handing out the like shuffle the deck, put it on a center table and make sure that's clean to start. But even better though, there's apps out there. So I was looking at one app and yes, it uses your specific phone to hold up the cards, but you can just like, hold the phone out to people like here's your role do you see it okay next here's your role do you see it next here's your role then you can even eliminate all those cards yep and that was werewolf or mafia one of the few times you're actually going to hear that recommended yes. on this show i am if you're if you're stuck alone and you're desperate enough now i gotta i gotta think there's probably not a lot enough people a lot of people stuck at home with enough people to play werewolf or mafia but i'm sure there are cases where and you when, would have a big enough group. and when we get past this Yes. And, and, you, and, and you're at a point where you've just got someone who's got the sniffles. You can use your yes. isolation then. Exactly. All right. Here's my first one we call a hack, gaming hack. It's when you take a game where normally you would share a bunch of components and do something to re reduce that contact. And I'm just using this as an example. You could probably do this with other games. And I don't even know why this one popped into my head. I think it's because the original version of the game, which I own, didn't have some of the things, the new one. So Robo Rally is the game, 
And this is a program movement game that you have to tweak a couple things, but basically you share almost nothing. Now, this is only the new one, because in the original game, you had a shared deck of cards. So you have, uh, a, like everyone pulls from the same programming card deck and then puts into the same discard pile and you shuffle. So it's terrible for what we're talking about today. Well, the newest printing from Hasbro gives everyone their own deck. And that's why this game popped out in my head was, hey, everyone has their own stuff. They have their own miniature. They have their own deck. They have the, the, their own player board. But then there is still some stuff that's shared. But you know what? There's still ways to get around it. So there's an upgrade deck. The, and there's upgrade cubes. And when you move over certain spots of the board, you collect a cube. And then you can spend the cubes to buy upgrades. Well, what you can do is you can give every player their own upgrade deck. So you just take the deck and shuffle it and give everyone their own deck. So then what's even neater there is that everyone's going to have different options available to them that makes the game a little asymmetric. And same thing with those cubes. Just make sure everyone has their own little stack of cubes instead of um, sharing from the, the, the main pool. And the same with the damage cards. So there's three different types of damage cards, and this is a deck builder. We're going to throw them in your deck. Well, just split up the various damage cards before you start playing so everyone has their own pile. And then when a player gets something, they just use their own pool. The only other thing is what we talked about with Sorcerer is one player owns the board and all the miniatures. They touch all the stuff. The, the, probably the owner of the game, right, is what I would go with. Yeah, and that was Robo Rally. All right, next is a party game. And what I was thinking here is that a lot of party games, concept just being one of my favorites, is if you can find a moderator, someone who can like run the game, then only one person has to touch the pieces. Now, concept in particular has a large board with a bunch of icons on it, and the person giving out the clues is going to touch all these little plastic pieces and put them on the board. Well, if you have one player be the person that gives out the clues over and over, the rest of the players can guess. Now, the problem here, though, is keeping players from crowding together to be able to see the board. So this one you may want to split into teams, basically so you can have like a group of two people come up and then they go away and another group of two people come up. Uh, this is, again, I'm thinking like, you know, five, six people stuck in a house together at the most. The larger groups, obviously, this may not work as well. The other thing, though, is you can pick up an XL play mat, which is huge. Like this thing is massive. That makes it a lot easier for people to see from further away. So uh, I find uh, this one a bit riskier than most because the personal space issue on yeah. concept is is probably the most violated uh, of the games we've chosen here. But, uh, you know, there are ways. So that was concept. Yeah, again, with low player counts, right? If, you, if you're only playing four people, you got one yep. person to this side, one person to that side, two meters apart, they should be able to see it. And again, these are also suggestions for when we're not under quite as strict restrictions once once things have been lifted. All right. Um, during our, our intermission, or before we started here, I mentioned I'm not going to talk about our RPGs, and some people are going to think this is an RPG. Personally, I think it's more of a hybrid, and that is For the Queen. This is a card game where players are improvising, creating characters, and the relationship between those characters and their queen while on a journey to a foreign country. Now, normally, this game is all about passing a deck around. So you have a deck of cards. All the rules are in the deck of cards. Everything you need is in the deck of cards. You normally would read from it and then pass it, then the next person would read and pass it. Well, just remove that passing. Have one person ask all the questions, read all the rules. Now, there is one other shared component, and that is an X card. But the only thing you have to do here is replace it with a hand signal. Whatever you prefer to use, crossing your arms, whatever that happens to be, you just replace it with a hand signal and... You know what? With this game, players don't even have to be in the same location. Um, with today's video conferencing and messaging software, you don't have to be in the same country to be able to play for the Queen. So there is no need to be in close contact for this game at all. And I believe it is available on Roll20 specifically, yes? Yeah, it is, but it's like 10 bucks. So you got you to gotta buy it if you do it that way. But that is cheaper than the physical game. I'm actually tempted to pick it up because I don't own the physical game and it would be a way to have the game. All right, well, that was For the Queen. All right, having one person do all the work is going to be the theme for the, the next few, possibly the rest of our suggestions. So another one is Legacy of Dragonhold. This is, it's sold as a role-playing game from Fantasy Flight. I would say it's not. Uh, it's an adventure game that basically uses mechanics from the old Witch Way style books that many of us grew up with. Uh, mostly like the fighting fantasy Way of the Tiger style of books. Now, normally, the game requires, again, players to pass around the book. 
so that everyone has a chance to do the reading and then all the other player and all the and um pass around the dice because there's die rolls involved and all the other players giving input on which way to go well again just have one player do the reading and the dice while still getting all the input from the rest of the group on which decisions are made. So if it's Sean's turn to read, it's also his turn to make the decision. Well, I'm going to read for him, but it's still his turn. Yep, that was Legacy of Dragonhold. All right, very similarly, there is, we mentioned Choose Your Own Adventure books. There is now two Choose Your Own Adventure board games. I'm specifically talking about the House of Danger one here, but as far as I can tell, they're both equally well-reviewed, so... Uh, this is the modern board game, not the classic books, um, though these are actually based on it. There was a House of Danger, Curse of uh, Choose Your Own Adventure book, and the board game is based on that book. Now, this is on the list for the exact same reason as Dragon Hole, right? There's no reason one player can't do all the reading, rolling, and tracking required to play through the entire House of Danger. And that was Choose Your Own Adventure, House of Danger, but works for the, the other uh, ones as well. Yeah. The other one that's, I don't remember the name of it. I looked it up at one time. I didn't note it here in the notes. Uh, next, a classic game, classic Canadian game, Trivial Pursuit. Uh, if you have someone willing to bite the bullet and play moderator, Trivial Pursuit can be played with players sitting a good distance apart or possibly even teleconferencing with only one player having to contact with the game components. The moderator is going to read out all the clues and interacts with the board and do all the movement and dice rolling. Now, I chose Trivial Pursuit specifically because everyone knows Trivial Pursuit, but I think this hack is going to work with every guessing trivia party game. Now, the one nice thing with Trivial Pursuit is if you have multiple editions, and there are so many, each person could have a different edition to be asking questions from. It would be a little, mm -hmm. a little strange, but there is some uh, you know, shared knowledge, and in theory, it should all sort of balance out. That way, one person maintains the scoring board and the dice, but everyone gets a chance to ask yep. and answer questions. You might even be able to split it up if people have multiple copies so that each player, each different player plays a different category See? instead of even sets, right? Like Sean answers, ask the science questions. I ask the, I don't know, the politics questions. This shows how long it is since I played any edition of Trivial Pursuit. I think sports is one of them. I don't even know. Yep. It's been a long time. Well, that was Trivial Pursuit. Or really any other trivia question asking game. All right, the big boy, uh, Gloomhaven. So this Deanna asked me to put this on the list because to be honest, she pointed out, I, again, as long as you make one player in charge of everything, which I admit is a bit of a burden, like setting up the board and moving everything on the board and tracking all the conditions, all an individual player needs to touch are their own cards. Their, the, their own deck, their own damage deck, and their own, their own whatever, the, the class deck, right? Um, th there's no reason I need to move my miniature or I need to help set up. Like, it, I obviously want to do that on every stage just to help, but there is um, no reason one person can't do the work. Now, what I do strongly recommend, though, is if you do this, get the excellent Gloomhaven Helper app. It's literally called Gloomhaven Helper. That will eliminate more than half of your components and stuff you need to track. And the other thing, too, is if you've got one person doing all the other stuff, Someone else take over the app and do all the apps part and split that up. Yeah, the app, uh, the app for Gloomhaven really does make a huge difference uh, in in managing things. Not only just in the normal game, but also yep. if you're working on isolation. That was Gloomhaven and the Gloomhaven Helper app. All right, next one's on here because anytime I talk to Sean, it makes me think of this game now, and that is the Duke. Now this is a chess-like abstract game where players each have their own bag of playing pieces so that the key here is you have only your own stuff now normally when you're playing this game you're going to end up touching both things and that usually happens when you capture an, a, an opponent's piece right so instead of you capturing the piece you just say hey i'm going to capture your pikeman and the person whose pikeman it is picks it up uh that way there's no reason you need to touch each other's components now of course this works best if you each own your own copy but as long as things are sanitized and clean before you start it's you take your bag, I'll take my bag. Now, I picked the Dukes, I love the Duke, but really, this applies for chess itself, or checkers, or war chest, or any of these other abstract strategy games with capturing. Again, just get it through your head, remember, because that's going to be hard, that you let your opponent pick up their own pieces. Yep, absolutely. Uh, 
And again, if you are sharing uh, components, let them sit for three days between playing. Yes. <laughs> Especially if you can't uh, you can't clean them if they are uh, you know if they will absorb water like cardboard uh, pieces and things like that. Yes. Uh, the virus only lasts on cardboard for twenty four hours. Uh, and that was the Duke and other similar games. Yeah, yeah. I kind of picked one game to highlight each thing. So another one here. Um, this this basically again could have been with the card game. So it's Star Wars Destiny. I, I actually um, advocate this, this game way more often than I probably should. It's, it's a solid game. My, my daughter loves it, so that's part of it. So the thing here is this is a combination of dice game and card game. And it has all the isolation benefits of a trading card game like Magic the Gathering or the ones we talked about earlier. Because players can construct their decks and select their dice in private, only touching their own stuff before getting together. And then when it's time to play, you just kind of make sure everyone has their own resources. So in that game, there's um, there's money, there's resources and damage counters. Make sure you each have your own set. There's no need to even play together, to be honest. This is another one that'll work good over teleconferencing. Excuse me, teleconferencing. But again, that's a little rough if players don't know the cards by sight. Yeah, absolutely. But that was Star Wars Destiny. All right, this is our last one. I told you I don't have a very extensive list this time. Though I admit some of the games we mentioned are kind of broad generalizations for game types. And that's kind of what this is. So this one, I got to give credit to Jeff Seuss and our chat room for kind of talking about this game, talking it up because he recently played with his wife. And when he described how they played, I realized this might be perfect for when you're trying to reduce contact. And that is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Now you can play this mystery game with one player doing all the component manipulations. So thing, same thing, one person's gonna control the board and all the pieces where the other players help with the deductive part. Now, even better in this game, you can kind of split the duties. So you can have one person hold the newspaper. You have another player who's the one who's interacting with the telephone registry, and another player's got the notes and taking notes in their notepad. And then all of you can basically stare at the map from a distance, or what Jeff recommended is actually using your phone to take pictures of the map so you can kind of sit back and look at it on your own and on your own device. And again, so this is one example, but there are multiple There are multiple Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games or other detective mystery games like this one. So I'm more looking at the broad genre of the game, but specifically calling out this one. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, the great hack, it really is a great hack. Taking pictures of the board game, uh, of any board that you're using in yep. a game can really help minimize contact with that board from players. Uh, and that goes for a lot of games. Even if you're, <laughs> I mean, we use that, well, we use that on uh, uh, Legacy of Lopan when we all had to, yes. we needed to leave the game and, and we, we knew we yep. couldn't let it set up. So we all took pictures of our player boards in the game. And three weeks later when we showed up, we had it all set up exactly yeah. as it was when we left. The nice part about that, too, is one of the things you do want to avoid at this time, and it's one of those you're going to forget. You know, you've got all your own components, you've got all your own stuff, but then everyone's going to come and lean over the board at once. You don't want to do that. You're trying yeah. to avoid that right now. So being able to go up one person at a time and look at the map is kind of a pain. Oh, wait, did you see this road over here? Oh, hold on. It's your turn to come look, right? <laughs> Take a picture of it on your phone, walk away, and then you can share what you're, what you're talking about, your, your phone or mobile device. And that was Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Well, that's the end of the games list we have, but I had a few suggestions that I compiled to uh, sort of give some extra hacks and help in helping out people keep that isolation. So there mm -hmm. are other steps that can be taken for not only play with others, but even with your own home when someone will be going out and getting groceries and things. People, even if we are isolating, we are still unfortunately no, or fortunately, forced to yeah, have some contact with others and the outside world. And my first tip is sleeved cards. Because if you're playing your card games and you've got sleeved cards, you can dis disinfect them. You can wipe mm -hmm. them down with a Lysol wipe or a rag that's been sprayed down with your disinfectant of choice. Um, yep. You know, sleeved cards means a way cleaner and more sanitary card game. Uh, and that goes for anything. I mean, honestly, card games are kind of gross yep. if you if you think about them in the big picture. Uh, to, next... to be honest, I agree. I, I play unprotected. That's, that's a personal preference, but it's definitely less sanitary. It, it's something, again, with, with what's going on, you're more aware of these things. And yep. I'm like, oh, there, there's a reason to sleeve cards I hadn't thought of before. I personally hate that, that they become slippery and they're hard yeah. to stack and they're hard to shuffle. Plus, I don't play, if, in my opinion, if I play a game long enough that the cards get ruined, I'll just go buy another copy of the game because I obviously love that game and the person who designed it deserves my money again. I wouldn't feel guilty buying another copy of Terraforming Mars for the amount of times I got out of there. 
Yep. The other thing too is technically you can buy cheap enough sleeves that you could just toss them out and re-sleeve, but that's a lot of time to spend. Yeah, yeah. So next up, latex gloves. Now do not go out and buy these. Please do not go out and buy latex gloves. But if you have an open box of latex <laughs> gloves, the hospital isn't going to want that. So you can slip on a pair to use while you're setting things up. Just remember, if you are wearing latex gloves for some purpose, don't touch your face. The moment you touch your face, you have now defeated the purpose of the latex gloves in both directions, both protecting others and protecting yourself. And no trans restriction on not buying them. That's in, during the current pandemic. When the world returns to normal, feel free, buy yeah. latex gloves. Absolutely. Uh, there's something you should always have around your house, really. Um, I have, and, and even even just not even necessarily latex, like your, your usual kitchen gloves. Yep. If you're that concerned, especially nowadays, just when setting up the game, right? So the, quite a few of the games we mentioned earlier have shared components at the beginning of the game, right? We're talking about splitting decks up between players. Well, wear the gloves while you're doing that splitting up, right? So when you're setting up Sorcerer, get a hold of the person you're playing with, ask them what heritage, lineage, and I forget the domain they want to use and get those out using the gloves. And then you can stick to having your own components after. So next up, UV sterilizers. Now, oddly enough, I discovered that this is something that some people have in their homes sometimes. Okay. Um, now, follow the instructions, and because they're all going to be different, uh, but be careful, because these things are really prone to breaking down. Uh, even in the hospitals, they break down regularly. So if you're using them a lot more than just cleaning off your cell phone every once in a while, which is what a lot of them are made for these days, they may break down a lot quicker than you expect than, you know, once a week throwing your phone in there for a while. Um, I don't have much to say on that. I didn't <laughs> know that was even something yeah. people bought at home. Yeah, so. you can, uh, I, I found them on Amazon for like 75 bucks. You can get one that's about the size of, of most uh, large phones okay. for, cleaning, for cleaning your phone. Um, Fair. But uh, now next up is, and this is something that really we should all do more often regardless mm -hmm. of whether there's a pandemic or not. And that's table cleaning. This right now is super important. Sanitize before and after. Yeah. There are lots of cleaners out there. So if you aren't hoarding bleach wipes, you probably have a spray cleanser and a clean rag you can use to give those surfaces a good wipe down. Again, before and after you're done. Yeah, that's a big one. That's an important one. I admit I'm bad at it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not terrible. Like, I wipe down the table before every Gloomhaven game. It's at least once a week. But I'll admit, when people aren't coming over, I tend to not do it. With just D and I play or me, D, and the kids, I'm not, I'm not so great at cleaning the table. But when I got to clear it off anyway to switch games that are set up, I do do it. Yeah. So another recommendation, which kind of goes with the sleeving, is laminating. If you can, laminate your components. Uh, this is especially useful for um, games with, like, player aids and player handouts. But you can also do it for boards. Uh, along with laminating, you can use um, spray varnish. So I learned this trick from Snakes and Lattes. Snakes and Lattes literally varnishes every board, and then they can wipe it down. So it's a it's a good way to clean it up. And then Ryan Peach in our chat room is reminding us, because he's mentioned this before, is coin capsules, which a growing number of people are using to protect their tokens in their games, or their, even their money, or round components, or smaller components. Anything you can do that puts a plastic over the cardboard is going to be good because as Sean mentioned, it lasts at a different amount. So easy to wipe down, easy to clean. Uh, RPGs, I, I know that wasn't our main topic tonight, but um, sleeve your character sheets. So you, I, you don't necessarily have to laminate them, but even if you just buy sleep protectors or sheet protectors, it's a, it's a good way to at least your character sheets, your notes, your, your, your DM notes, whatever you're going to use. Using sleep protectors, you can then wipe them down at the end. Player handouts should always be laminated or again in some kind of protector. Yeah, and just remember, though, if you are sleeving, that is so that you can wipe them down with a disinfectant because yes. viruses do last longer on plastic than they do on paper and cardboard. Right. Uh, but it allows you to, to wipe them down by putting them in plastic. So, you know, you, 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 you take a step back by putting them in plastic, but it allows you to clean them better. Correct. So, and again, my final tip is be aware. We are used as gamers to helping each other out moving things for other people, sharing things, and we need to concentrate at this time not to slip into those old habits. If you're tired, it's really easy to get sloppy and undo all the efforts we've been working towards today. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say, like, it's so easy to forget, right? 
I could see being perfectly not sharing a single thing, not touching anything, and then the game ends, and then you start gathering everything up to help clean up, right? Like, it's just because yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. Now, we are not also not advocating. We're not trying to be germaphobes here. Like, the, we're in exceptional circumstances right now. So, yes, there are ways you can be better. But I also would be rather frustrated if someone showed up to my game night six months from now or a year from now and everything's normal. It's like, I'm sorry, I'm not helping you clean up because I don't want your germs. I would be a little frustrated by yeah. that. So it, it's going to be a balancing act. Again, mostly it's be aware, right? So that that's the biggest thing with all of this is think about this stuff and do what you can to try to eliminate co-contamination or contamination or sharing every little germ you can while playing games. I don't think the current world situation says don't play with each other. What we're trying to do is give you ways you can play with each other and make it a little safer. It's totally well, not going. We're not suggesting Twister. Now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic and we've ended on that wonderful thought of playing with each other, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. That is another recommendation. You know what the safest way to play board games right now would be to play by yourself. Note I said bye. <laughs> Stick to solo games. There are a ton of games out there with solo modes. That might be our topic next week. Um, another uh, perspective topic is games that are easy to clean. So that was something else we talked about. We didn't really, like Sean kind of talked about it there, but also if you stick to things that are easy to clean, dice games and roll them rights, especially if you have a laminated board, are fantastic because you can easily clean and disinfect all of the components for the game when you're done playing. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Danielle was pointing out at one point during the uh, episode that you know most people can div dig out enough dice on their own that they yes. can roll. So if you're playing Trivial Pursuit, everyone will have can have their own dice because True. well, we do. True. Yeah, Twister is easy to clean. It is. It Except is that easy spinner, I think you, you gotta you gotta you do know something what? with the spinner. If you're, uh, I have to say this. This is this is a, a pro tip. There is a spinner app on. Oh, there you go. Uh, in the app stores, that's way better than using the actual spinner because <laughs> my kids right. have Twister and the spinner warps really easily and doesn't yep. actually spin that well so for true mm -hmm. randomization get yourself the spinner app uh. all right so i noticed our chat room had the same problem i did while trying to come up with this list it's not easy like almost every game you can think of you're like no wait i passed that oh wait we both touched that i you know like that's just a thing right like like the game that's part of it is just shared social experience. That's why we're gaming together. We're supposed to all be at the same table together, sharing an experience, interacting and having that social thing going on. So trying to pull those aw aspects away from board games, kind of make it so it's not a board game anymore. Right? Like I'm thinking, Oh, Onitama, there's a chest. Like, Oh wait, no, you pass the cards to the opponents after your turn or like, like all of those games, like Twilight Imperium, who wants to be the person moving all the ships? Like, like who wants it? Like, yeah, you can technically do it because everyone's got their own thing. But then there's a shared deck of, of uh, resources. There's a shared deck. I'm like, no, no, that doesn't work. Yep. Uh, Ryan mentions uh, Kingsbird. If everyone has their own supply of plus two tokens. Kingsburg. I think that's a dice placement game, though. So what I'm thinking, Kingsburg, from what I know of it, you're going to roll a set of five dice, and then you're going to place those dice out on a board. Everyone would need their own dice, and there would be the slight concern of um, everyone touching the same board. Like, if you're careful, you can put dice on a board and take it off without touching the board, but you have to be careful of that, not touching the board while you're doing it. And you're all sharing the same board. So it's it might be one of those where everyone has to back off while you put yours out. If right. you're trying to keep that two meter distance, have everyone stand away from the table. Okay, I'm gonna take this action, I'm gonna take this action, I'm gonna do this thing. And then you back up and someone else goes in with their own dice and does their thing. Right. That's, that's the only concern I can think of. Um, what I can't remember in Kingsburg, if there's, if you need to remember whose dice are which, but you can do that easy enough with different colored dice. Yeah, there's colored dice in Kingsburg. It's already, it's, it's blue, they're blue, black, red, white, yellow colored dice. Yeah. I, I don't know, I, I admit, I don't own the game. I have played uh, my friend Jamie's copy a couple times. I don't remember if there's anything else. But yeah, you just have to be careful to place the dice without touching the board. Yeah. Um, I thought there was a deck where monsters come out or something, but that might be something one player could do. Yeah, how many games have stealing mechanics where you yeah. take stuff away from other people, right? Yep, like it's no, just it's, it's it's shocking how common shared resources are, right? Like like there's enough games maybe I, if they come with enough cubes, I'm using cubes as a generic for resources here, you might be able to give everyone their own pool. 
Like I'm, I'm thinking gold West, right? There's probably not enough in there, but if you gave everyone enough silver, enough gold and enough wood and enough thing, they had their own little pile of stuff, but yeah. then there's still the map. Like you're going to end up touching that board. Yep. No, absolutely. Even, even something as, as, uh, as sort of asymmetrical and separate as uh, Terramistica, you know, there's enough, there's enough. There, well, there's stuff. those, the terraforming tokens. Like it's just, it's a big pool because they're not the same on both sides. Yeah. And, and again, like, yeah, you might be able to have one player move or anything, but you need to be close. You need to be able to look at the board You've got your little power pools. There's the, oh, I build a bridge, so I'm putting that out. It's just, again, it's it, that's really risky. There's a lot of stuff being touched by different people. You also have the pool of, that one definitely wouldn't work because of the pool of, um, I can't remember what they're called, the technology cards or whatever. Oh, yeah. The, yep. the things when you when you yeah, build yeah. A, a sanctuary, you're yep. taking from a pool right there. So right there, it wouldn't work. Yep. So that one's disqualified. Yep. Yeah, Wallace is on my shirt somewhere. Luckily, that's a... Luckily, we've got Board Game Arena for Terra Mystica, so yeah, we can still. So that's that's the other thing, right? This uh, we obviously didn't go there this week. Maybe that's something we're going to do next week. Is obviously the safest thing you can do is is play solo or play digitally, play online, play. I'm on my computer, Sean's on his computer. We don't have to be together. We can be across the world. That is obviously the safest way. But you know what? I'm stuck with these people in my house. I want to play games. I want to play games with them, right? Like that's. I said games. No, no, I just think about how you're stuck with these people in your house. Oh, I'm <laughs> terrible. I hate this. Horrible. I'm stuck with. I can't believe it. Oh. See, we're we're all kind of uh, feeling the cabin fever here a little yeah. bit. No, absolutely. Uh, so I mean, I I did not see any other recommendations in the chat. So uh, sleeving being in, uh, uh, important. Yeah, sleeving and the coin, the coin protectors. You know, again, coin protectors using using plastic to protect so that you can disinfect is the key yes. that's 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 the whole thing yeah. you use the plastic so that you can properly disinfect things very true all right we gotta talk to nightbot they keep just tossing the same quote out i know over i don't understand again. why it's not randomizing well i need to take a look at that I, it's a great quote but it, it does need to be uh randomized well, welcome zalipa Absolutely. That's a name I don't recognize from the chat. Yeah, and there was... There we was usually a... try to say hi to new people, but we don't yep. do it while we're in the middle of a segment. <laughs> we're not ignoring you. I always I always do try to at least get a hi in the chat, but uh, not not out loud uh, sometimes. Oh, nice, nice busy chat. Thank you all. And you can still chime in. If you guys, you folk, think of one while we're going, feel free to, to point it out. I would love to add to that blog post. Like... And, there, and Vixen Dex. There's another another new one. No, sorry, Vixen Dax, and also, uh, sorry, Azwipi. Azwipe? Azwipe. Azwipe. Azwipe was in earlier, yeah, and hi, yeah. Vixen Dax. All right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there's a few new new ones in there. All oh. right, moving on. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, retweet, share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the warp, works, and we're only four people away from our YouTube channel hitting 400. Three, three people. Three people three. now away from hitting 400 uh, uh, subscribers on YouTube. Yes. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. If you want to hit arbitrary round numbers because they're important. They make us feel validated. Absolutely. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all of the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. This week's will be going out tomorrow. I did not get to it today, unfortunately. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com, and I have to remember to not keep saying the rest of that automatically. Yes, <laughs> yes we, we do. It. There is technically a spot to subscribe on the sidebar, but now that we have Mediavine, it's just hard to find. It's That's there. Terrible. It's technically there. So if you say it, it's not going to hurt anything. <laughs> All right. So a note on our live stream. So except for this show right now that you folk are watching and uh, that you're welcome to join every Wednesday, uh, everything else is on hold, right? Uh, we stopped doing Thursday night streams a while ago. I finally took that off the schedule. But most importantly is Friday nights. We probably are not going to be doing anything on Friday nights for the foreseeable future. Now, there's a chance we might put something together. Um, I might do a Gloomhaven solo run on a Friday. I do have, there's a huge box behind me that I'm going to open up tonight. And what's in there is going to need to be unboxed at some point. So I'm going to record that. Uh, one of my kids wants to record an unboxing video, which is cool. But basically, with everyone on lockdown, we're not going to be on any regular schedule. 
Yeah, and uh, I've actually got a video game that I'm going to be streaming. It uh, is on hold right now until April 10th uh, okay. when it comes off embargo, but it's actually a uh, digital version of a board game, basically. That's never been a board game, but it is very much a dice place, worker placement uh, okay. board game in digital format. So Sounds we'll be cool. seeing that uh, a little later in April. Uh, otherwise, just keep an eye on our social feeds and you'll be sure to get a heads up when we're going to be doing something. Yeah, just follow us on Twitch. That's the easiest way. If you follow us on Twitch, turn on notifications. We'll get your buzzers will go off and you'll get an email and all that. All right. Medium. This game right here. Oh, look, I still have a copy that I haven't been able to give away. I am sorry to say that we never heard back from Don. So I feel bad for you, Don. I apologize. Um, I tried sending from three different email addresses. We gave it two weeks. So... Well, I'm sorry for Don's sake, but I guess I'm not so sorry for the rest of you because I still got a copy of Medium to give away. And we're going to do that right now. So Deanna actually drew our new winner earlier today. And the winner of one copy of Medium is... Danielle from Buffalo, New York, better known to us fans as Major Kayla in our chat room. Congratulations, Danielle. Uh, we'll get in touch soon to get your address and get your copy of Medium in the mail as soon as we can. So I gotta admit, things may be delayed. I don't even know what's going on with the post office right now. I don't even know if they're open to accept packages. I assume they are, but it might be a little bit before I can get this out into the mail. Yeah. Up next, a review of 8-Bit Box from ELO. As I then close the notes. All right. Full disclosure, I brought home a review copy of the 8-Bit Box from the Yellow booth at Origins 2019. Uh, the 8-Bit Box is a gaming system. It was designed by Frank Critton and Gregory Largi. Or Largi, sorry, I apologize for mispronouncing the name. It features art from Jean-Baptiste Reynaud and was published by Yellow in 2018. Now, this is true for the base game, as well as the three games that are included with the original game box. Despite the fact that it's one of the first videos we ever recorded, our 8-Bit Box unboxing video is still one of the best ways to see what you get with a copy of 8-Bit Box. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into detail about all the bits and everything you get here. Uh, you can see that on the video or just check out the blog version of this review where I do detail all the different components. What I will say here is that I was overall impressed by the quality here, especially the player controllers, like the, the player pieces. The, the I want to say player boards, but they're not boards. They're shaped like controllers. They are well-designed, look like actual video game controllers, and they work perfectly during gameplay. And while I haven't played the game a ton of times, they seem sturdy enough to stand up to repeated use. So you call this a gaming system. What does it mean by that? All right, so similar to the way the Nintendo Entertainment System is a tool to play various different video games, this is a tool to play various different board games. Now, the game comes with a range of different components, enough components for up to six players that are meant to be used by all of the various eight book box games. And some components are gonna be used in some and some aren't in others. Now, three of the games that come with this, three games come with this original box, and they, each individual game, also has some of its own components as well that you're going to mix with the stuff in the core set. And there are other games that will be able to be bought separately, in theory at least, because right now, Yo has released one other game. So there are a grand total of four different games that can be played with this system. Now, each individual game, they call them cartridges, which I thought was cute, and the boxes look kind of like a Super Nintendo game. So each individual cartridge will have additional components and rules on how to play that game using the components from the base game in it. Now, while the components are shared, the actual gameplay is completely different in each of the various different games. So how about you tell us with the, about the three different games you get with the core yep. box, starting with Pixoid. All right, Pixoid, uh, as soon as you see this, you're instantly gonna know what license they're, they're borrowing from, and that is Pac-Man. Um, shaving the serial numbers off of? Yes, yes saving the serial numbers off poorly, I will say. Uh, this plays three or four players in about 50 minutes, so super quick game. Now, the board is called a circuit board, and the players are playing viruses, but the board just looks like a maze with a bunch of dots on it, and while well, the viruses kind of look like ghosts. 
And they are trying to catch Pixoid or Pac-Man or yeah, Pixoid in this case. Anyway, so each round, uh, a different person is going to take on the role of Pac-Man, pick Pixoid. You're going to play a different person. They're going to move around the circuit board, trying to collect white cubes and survive as long as they can. The other players are going to play the viruses, trying to catch Pixoid. Now, Pixoid's going to get one point per round they survive with bonus points for the cubes they're able to pick up as they move around the map. Now, after each player's had a turn playing Pixoid, the game ends. Player who's got the most points wins. Uh, this is a dead simple game. All you are doing on your controller is programming two things. Are you moving up, down, left, or right? And how far are you moving up, down, rest, or right? That's it. Everyone does that simultaneously. Once everyone's ready, you flip it up and then just do it on the board. If Pixoid gets caught, round's over. Otherwise, just keep going until someone catches that little Pixoid guy. All right, well, simple enough, but it sounds like you probably need more than just two players to really make this one interesting. After all, it took three ghosts to make Pac-Man interesting. Yeah, this one literally says three or four players. Doesn't even recommend playing it at three. What's interesting is um, this actually possibly many of these games might actually fall under our earlier topic of tonight's show. Which I was just thinking about while describing Pixoid, as long as everyone had their own set of white cubes. Now, as for the game itself, it's dead simple. Uh, it's really simple to set up. It's simple to play. Everyone gets it. Like, as soon as you set the map, people are like, oh, I'm on board. I know what this is. This, this is Pac-Man. Uh, it's a quick, fun distraction. I do find, though, it's way too short. Like, 15 minutes is pushing it. It really doesn't take that long. What I actually recommend, recommend to make the game a little more interesting, especially because you can have a bad round in this, is give everyone two or three turns. And I got to say, to me, that actually makes it feel more like the actual game where everyone would have three lives. And the other thing I would do is change up the starting spots, because normally the starting spots are, are delegated by player color, but just mix them up because the boards are actually different. So just switch them like everyone rotate clockwise just to make it a little more interesting. Yeah, I think, well, this system suffered from, if anything, a lack of focus on how long it games should, how long its games should go, how, what, what the system is going to be used for. Yeah. Um, and so that was Pixoid. Now, how about you tell us about Outspeed next? I've played this one. Yeah. So Outspeed pays three to six players. Uh, this one, you're looking at 30 minutes-ish, really depending on the number of players and the amount of talking. Now, this is an attempt to capture the feel of multi-battle racing, multiplayer racing games where there's attacking the other players, battling racing games. Uh, Mario Kart, of course, would be the most famous nowadays. So this game seems to be based on an older SNES series called the F-Zero series. Just has a sci-fi look to it, but it's the same kind of game where you're racing and using power-ups to attack each other. Uh, you start by putting out two boards that represent the track, and then you make a deck of um, a tiles that also, okay, so the boards re represents player position. The deck represents the options in the track or what's in the track. And you're going to shuffle that and make a deck. Now, each player is going to pick a color, uh, put together the little car and put it on the track. Or, sorry, car, racer, whatever. They look sci-fi. And you're also going to grab a number of white cubes, which is your fuel. You flip the top card of the deck, and that's when the game begins. Now, this is really unique, and I, I can't compare this to any other game because what it does is each tile is going to show you three potential paths and the penalties and rewards for taking each path. The paths are labeled A, B, C. The rewards are usually power-ups or moving along the board, getting ahead in the race. And the penalties are usually spending fuel. Now, what's really well done is that the rewards and penalties for some of the paths are going to be based on how many players take one of the other paths, or some of the paths only allow so many players. So path A might say only two people can go down here, whereas path C might say five people can go down there. And if more than that go through, no one moves. And the other thing is you'll th have like path A will only move you up two spots, but you're gonna get X fuel, and X fuel is equal to the number of players that went down path C, where path C is awesome because it moves you five ahead, and only costs one fuel. But if you take a lot of C, you're actually helping the people, it's okay, right? You kind of get how that interacts. So what players are gonna do is secretly program their path. So all you're doing on your controller is setting it to A, B, or C, that's it. Uh, once everyone's picked, you flip it up and then you re-evaluate it. Now the funky part that it seems odd and I think everyone I've showed it to is, to be honest, slightly disappointed with, is the board. Because the board does nothing except show relative position. It could literally be a sheet of lined paper with lines on it to track where everyone is. 
um, obstacles, artwork, all of that doesn't matter. Now, there are two boards, which does matter, because once a player goes off the top of the one board, you take the board that's in the back, all the players that are on that are eliminated from the game, and you put it back to the front so that the board just keeps rolling. Now, play keeps going until you get to the finish line tile. I think it's 12 tiles in. I'm, I might be 15. You then resolve that final tile, and then whoever's furthest on the board wins. If there's anyone tied, it's whoever has the most fuel left. Now, <clears throat> this last bit, if player runs out of fuel before the end of the race, they also lose. And yes. that combined with the dropping off the back of the, map, back of the map is really the biggest problem with this game. Player elimination is something none of us really, you know, support yeah. but well in this game although i don't tend to mind it in short games so as long as you're not having that 45 minute game of speed you're gonna play in 15 minutes it's not that bad so overall i i would the, the thing that blows me away about this game is you are taking what's a very reflexes reflex based hand-eye coordination style of video game heavy dexterity game and turning it into basically a social deduction game because winning and outspeed is all about reading your opponents and trying to predict what path they're going to take. And to be honest, it's really good if people are talking. So if people are trash talking or working together, hey, if we both take A, we're both going to take A. All right, you're good. We're both going to take A. And then the stabbing in the back where it's, no, I actually took C because I get a bonus if you take A, right? That whole interaction, the, the discussing which path you're going to take. And I find it works. If you're playing silent, which I've done that, I sat down, played a game of Outspeed where no one just taught, they programmed the thing and played, it worked, but really shines when there's that whole cooperation and deception and, and social interaction of the game. My only complaint, though, is the track. Like, it, it's, to be honest, dumb. Like, I want the art on there to matter. Since it doesn't matter, it should feature less artwork or have just a bland, I don't know, desert picture. Instead, there's like a jump on it. And if you're going to put a jump on a, a jump ramp on a board, I better be able to use the jump ramp. Like, like, come on, I'm playing a racing game. There's a jump ramp on the board. Let me use the jump ramp. Or there's, there's rubble. Let me dodge the rubble or something. Yeah, this I completely agree. The art's irrelevant. And that's a big disappointment when you've got what is actually a really good looking board and the memory of these games being obstacles to dodge. Yes. That's what these games were. And if you're trying to give us that feel, of that game, you're failing really badly at it. Yeah, like, like it just told you, it, like if it wasn't there, if it was just, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what I put on for artwork, but something with some nice thick lines that say one through 12 on them and another one, and that was it. And it just so relative position, I'd be like, all right, sure. Yeah. Now you got to try this last time you were down. Uh, it was only a three player game with Deanna and she got eliminated early. So what'd you think of it for the, the one play? Well. Well, again, this box, uh, everything about this system is really great quality. Uh, yeah. It suffers from low player count. Um, it's a party game. And if you're going to have a party game, you need a group party to play it with. Um, so that was Outspeed. Now, yep. the final game in the box is Stadium. Yes. So this is a team-based game. Uh, four to six players. It takes about 45 minutes. So this is the longest one. I'd say it would go up to an hour. The, the one game we played definitely went over an hour. And that's going to be dependent on how many people you have, how much trash talking there is, how much interaction. Now, this is trying to be your sports-based video games, the old epics games, track and field, summer Olympics, winter Olympics, or winter games, sorry, summer games, specifically summer games in this case with track and field. That whole two-button masher, left and right on your joystick, running games and jump and play through multiple different events and try to win medals. So we have the super quick Pixoid, yep. the Pixoid, the longer outspeed, and now the mm -hmm. comparatively lengthy Stadium. Very true. And it's a, a, what I like is they did a good job of showing off the different capabilities of the system by this. Now, Stadium, you're going to first determine which events are in your, in your whatever it is, Olympics or whatever you're playing through, track and field, whatever it is. And you use those, you build a board, which looks like a big track and field track. Um, you're going to pick teams. So there's a red team and a blue team. Uh, you're going to pick a character. Uh, the characters are mechanically identical, but they technically have background and different artwork. So not much, uh, no, none of our much loved asymmetry here. No. But again, very much a party feature you don't want you want a quick setup to or you, you don't want a quick setup game to suffer when you have too many choices uh you know setting it up so you you yeah, want it to be quick and easy 
this, this is pick the character that looks coolest to you. Now, you're going to play through 10 rounds. Each round is going to be a different event. Now, each event is its own mini game that's going to involve one or more members of each team. Some events are just the person whose turn it is and other events are the entire team. Now, every event is different, but there is some overall rules for the game, some over some commonalities. Uh, first of all, your goal is to win medals, gold, silver, or bronze. Now, some, the team's just going to win a medal. So with two teams, someone's going to get silver, or silver, someone's going to get gold. But other events, individual players can win medals. So you can actually have it where one team wins two, another one, one team sweeps, and so on. Now, the overall goal of the game is to have the most valuable medals at the end, and there's a little scoring track to do that math to figure out. I don't remember how it works. Obviously, the player with the most golds might win, but if you have more silvers than the team with the most golds, you may win out based on points. Now, in addition to earning medals, every event is going to cost energy. Now, every character has their own energy pool, and it's something you each individually track, and you manage your own character's energy throughout the game. Uh, most events are going to cost energy to take part. So it's like, hey, we've gotten to the sumo match. Who wants to take part? You all have to spend so much energy to take part. And then while playing, there's often, almost every event has some way to spend more energy. So if you're in the sumo event, you might be able to re-roll a die by spending energy, or you might get plus two on your dice, or you might get to do something extra. And that is what the entire game ends up about, because the it, it's all about your energy. It's all about maintaining your energy. Because if a character runs out of energy, for one, they may not be able to enter certain events, and other chances, they're probably going to be able to enter events and do poorly. Now, as for the individual events, um, there are a ton of different events. They all play completely different. They make full use of the various components of the 8-bit box. Uh, some involve hitting hidden, de um, hidden decisions. Many of them invite dice rolls, lots of ways to spend energy. Like This really takes uses a lot of the components in the 8-bit box system. You mentioned running out of energy. Is there as much player elimination as outspeed, or are you never fully out of the game? No, in this one, like I said, there'll be certain events you may not be able to join. Like, you have to pay an energy cost to join. If you have no energy, you can't. From what I remember, you, you can't be eliminated fully. So, like, one of the events is fencing, and it's you spend, you get, you start with a, the white die, and for every additional point you spend, you get to add additional dice. Well, you'd be stuck with just the white die which you're probably not going to contribute much for your team, but you can still play. Now, of the three games that came with the core set, this is definitely the most involved. Um, it best uses the components that come with the 8-bit box. Uh, there is a ton of variety over the various sporting event mini games, some which are more complicated than others. Some are also more fun than others, but I didn't like hate any of them. There were definitely ones that I enjoyed more than others. Um, the thing this is really about, though, is the teamwork and managing your characters and your team's energy. Who's going to take part in what event? How much energy to spend is going to be the key to winning each individual event. But then the other thing is deciding which events you want to try hard on and which ones you might just not try so hard and plan to lose so you can save your energy for later events. At the same time, you've got to be reading the other team to try to figure out what they're doing, right? If you think they're going to throw the javelin, that might be the one you want to spend a little energy on to make sure you get the goal, right? Um, it, it, there's a, I don't know, it's a neat thought process, uh, the, the whole trying to maintain that energy level and make sure you can make it to the end of the event and not blow it all in one event. What I like about this one is it really highlights the versatility of the 8-bit box. And like there's some that use just dice, there's some that use the controller, there's some that use dice in the controller, some that use the cubes. Like it really takes advantage of all the different things. Plus, overall, I found this one to be the most rewarding of the three games. It felt less ephemeral, it felt less of a party game and more of like my, it felt more like my decisions mattered. All right. Well, that was Stadium, the last of the games that come with the 8-bit box. We know your thoughts on the individual games. What did you think about the 8-bit box as a whole? All right. First off, I got to say, I love the concept. Like when I saw this thing, I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. It's a board game trying to emulate the look and feel of retro video games. And you know what? It does that. It does a great job of that. The three games, including the core game, each try to capture a different feel of widely different video games. And they all manage to do it. They all feel like it. even the fact that Outspeed is a social deduction game. It feels like the choices you make while playing those games. Do I take the shortcut? Do I not? Do I save my power up? Do I not? Like, it's all there. I think the design here is brilliant. The, the work that went into building this thing, designing this thing is great, both physically and mechanically. Like, I, the physically, I love those controllers. They are so nice. And I like the way the individual games are in their own little boxes, and they look like video game boxes. 
I even like the, they call them cartridges because when you put it on your shelf, it kind of looks like a cartridge, and the system is meant to look like a, a, a video game system. I dig that design. And all three of the games are fun. Uh, they're they're very easy to teach and very accessible. Yeah, I, I think we're both in agreement that the from a design perspective, this game scored big, both in concept and quality. I, the first time I got one of those controllers in my hand, I oh, was yeah. shocked. At, at I, I knew it was a solid thing. I'd seen the unboxing, I'd, I and I, I knew it was a, a decent piece, but it still, it felt really good. I mean, they're not quite yeah. as thick as a as an old Nintendo controller, but they're no, but... that far off. I mean, it's it's a better sol- piece of solid gear than you'd expect. Now, the three games that come in the base game are all very easy to teach, and the reason for that is they are really simple. And here's where the 8-bit box is going to fall down for some people, mostly my gaming group, to be honest. They're quick and simple family weight games. Uh, my kids could play most of these. They're pretty much at the level of being party games. They're just not quite as silly, right? You're not going to get irrelevant. There's, there's no adult jokes are going to come into it, but they're as close to party games as you can get. They're over and done in less than an hour. They don't have a lot of depth to them, the, especially the like the, the Pac-Man Pixoid, like 10 minutes max to play a round of that. It, it makes them great for playing with new gamers and great for a casual game night, beer and pretzels game night, where you're all about socializing and you happen to be playing a game. But I got to say, they're not that interesting to gamers who like anything with a little bit of meat on it. Yeah. While hobby gamers might not take to them, these could be a fun family game to have and something kids of a certain age could play with their friends easily enough. Yeah, totally fair. Like, uh, for me, I found it to be disappointingly light. I was hoping for a bit more crunch, especially there's three games, right? We talked about how they're different lengths. They're all pretty dang light. Like, if... It would have been nice to have one heavier game in the box. That would have been kind of nice. Like, yeah, I expect a quick filler. Like, if I'm getting three games out of this thing, show me the quick filler. Show me the party game. But I didn't expect all three to be that light, quick filler game. I would have liked to have seen different weights in there. Yeah, and while the time play varied, the weight really didn't. Yeah, not really. Now, for those of you looking to potentially pick up a copy, uh, the decision should be made based on what you're looking for. If you want light, fun, quick to pick up, play with your, your your video gamer friends to show them, hey, here's a cool board game. Look, we'll play Pac-Man. Or, hey, it's New Year's Eve. We're going to have a bunch of people over to have some drinks, and we're going to play some light games. Great. Perfect. Pick this up. Check it out. You're probably going to have a lot of fun with this, especially if you like the classic video games, if you like the retro thing. If you're looking for, wow, this isn't you, but if you remember playing, you know, stand-up arcade games, this could be pretty cool. But if you're into non-beer and pretzel games and don't enjoy party games or games that are that light, this is probably not for you at least with the games that are currently released for it. Yeah, it should be noted that, while as we mentioned earlier, they only ever put out one other game for this. Mm. So it's questionable if this game is going to have ongoing support from Yellow, or if they've done what they wanted, and it's in the fans' uh, hands now. That being said, this is actually an open enough system with enough components in that original box that creative types could certainly manage to get some of their own fun 8-bit memories implemented as games. Actually, to be honest, it might, if you are a developer, a game publisher, or not a publisher, but if you're an indie game designer, it might be worth picking this up just for the bits. Yep. Like, those controllers could be used for so many different hidden movement games. Absolutely. And and just a ton of cubes. Again, I didn't want to get into the components, but there are a ton of cubes in this game. There are some dice with some really unique um sides on them we'll call it like the d- distributions they're all d6s but only one goes one to six like yeah i could definitely see it and to be honest it's probably out there i i didn't check board game geek but i would not be surprised if there is fan support for this game already out there yeah. well for a more in-depth look at the 8-bit box including some thoughts on the double rumble cartridge based on the side-scrolling beat-em-ups like double dragon Check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our table? Hi, every week. We like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended. Well, none of those anymore. And any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. All right, things are obviously still a little slow, as they are probably for everyone else. Though I do know there are an awful lot of people getting in role-playing in that hasn't happened in a long time. With the teleconferencing, I am seeing a lot of people that were scared 
of trying digital online gaming, jumping into it and loving it. Like even some local gamers, there's a, there's a couple hardcore uh, D and D gamers. We'll say they they play variants, Pathfinder and stuff like that. They were very against playing like on Roll Twenty and stuff. And like there's one who has totally embraced Roll Twenty and is working on their own hacks for it and programming for it and everything. So. I, for me, it's not happening right, right? Things are still slow here. Um, yes, I play some board game arena, but that's we've been doing that all along. That hasn't changed. I haven't added any additional events. Um, part of the problem is Deanna is still, has been feeling under the weather. No, it's not COVID. There's no worries about that, but she does have a seasonal flu. Um, so Deanna and I haven't been able to play anything. Um, my mom doesn't play board games. So basically it's just me and the kids right now. So uh, digital only here. The kids at my house are really still trying to adjust to this new paradigm now that we're supposed to be back in school after March break. You know, we let them yeah. get their, uh, you know, get their uh, their video screen on last weekend, but uh, we're still trying to work out some reasonable method of of work and play and things. So yeah, that's that's been interesting. We've been we've been doing a lot of that. We we I you know I give the kids math problems and we did some science experiments. We we we've, we've been doing that as well. Uh, most of the time when we're done that, they want to play on their the same same screens. But Big G is obsessed with Scratch right now and learning to program. She's learned some Python, so she's doing better than I am for programming awesome. now, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And Little G's all about the 2DS, so Pokemon and Animal Crossing, the old, not the brand new one everyone's going nuts for. But she's got a couple word games, so we make her play those first. Like, you got to play the word game for a while, and then you can po pop in Pokemon. So that's definitely been going on. Yeah. Um, we have sat down to play a little bit of a board gaming. It just hasn't happened a lot. It'll probably happen a little more as time goes on. Uh, this week, though, we did try something new. Um, this is Woodlands from Ravensburger. This is something that we gave little G for her birthday. Um, she did want to record an unboxing video, but unfortunately her patience wore out. And when we weren't around at one point, she decided to open it up, which I had a feeling might happen. So... We'll see. But anyway, she opened up Woodlands. Um, this is a newer game. Came out in the last couple of years, 2018, I think. Uh, plays two to four players. Says age is 10 and up, but I would say you could go younger than that. Um, there's reading required, but only like at the start of each scenario, you read the storybook, which a parent could easily handle that or an older sibling. So there is another game called Woodlands from 2014, but it doesn't seem to have gotten a lot of traction. Yeah. Just be aware if you are checking Board Game Geek that you could get either game if you're not paying attention. Yeah, this is Woodlands from Ravensburger, 2018. Yeah, it's 2018 and, uh, versus 2014 is the... Yep. So the theme of Woodlands is classic fables. Uh, the first story is Red Riding Hood, second Sherwood. I know there's an Arthur story. Um, I off the top of my head i actually don't even remember exactly how many scenarios are in there four or five different scenarios with the whole fairy tale theme uh gameplay is unique uh this is one that kind of blew my mind because uh the main feature of this game are transparent sheets with all kinds of symbols on them uh these are like for, for people at sean and i's age overhead projector sheets basically that we grew up with there are four or five for each scenario the first one has four all the others have five and then there's two extra sheets that are used that you can use to add to the others to increase the difficulty and replayability. Now, we didn't touch any of that at this point. We just tried scenario one. So to play, what you do is you put the first sheet for the first story in the middle of the table. Uh, we put it over a piece of white paper just to make it stick out a little better. You put that in the middle of the table. Then players get a bunch of map tiles. So you have map tiles that are um, like they're just they're they're. They show pathways. So it's a mix of path and forest. And I couldn't tell you the grid off the top of my head, but say it's three by three and the three by three is filled in with either one or the other, right? So you have all these different paths. Well, everyone has the same 12 tiles. And what you're gonna do is the sheets out, you're gonna read from the book and tell you what the story that's going on right now. And it's gonna involve the character. So like the first part of the first story is you are Red Riding Hood and you are trying to get her to the signpost that'll lead her to grandma's. And that's pretty much it on the, on the first map. And there's a couple other things on there. So then you flip a timer. And to be honest, I don't even know how long the timer is. And you're going to take nine of your 12 tiles and build a map out of them, a three by three grid. You have a technically you have a player board to do this on, but you don't necessarily need it. And you're going to build a map. So this reminds me a lot. These plastic sheets remind me a lot of etch a sketch overlays. From my, uh, that was the first thing I thought of when I when I saw them. And and really, what you're doing is you're you've got you know you're building a hedge maze that yep. you're going to drop an overlay on to make sure it works. 
Yep, that's exactly it. That That's the next step. So once everyone's got their map built or the timer runs out, there's some rules for that. You're going to take that overlay, put it on your map, and score points based on if you did what the story tells you to do. Uh, so like I said the first one is like if you get Red Riding Hood to the to the the the, the uh, signpost, you get six points. But then there'll be other stuff because on one of the maps there'll be mushrooms and there's yummy mushrooms and poison mushrooms. Well, you get plus one point for every yummy mushroom you make Red Riding Hood go over, and you lose one point for every poison mushroom. Right? That's just a, a rough example. Yeah. No. Now, it's uh, it's a it's a fun little thing, and again, it's it's all just simple mazes, right? It's, yeah. it's hedge mazes. So not something that's difficult for uh, younger kids. No, not at all. Now, each scenario is going to have multiple parts, and they tend to get a little more interesting and complicated. So one of the examples, I think it was number three. It was from the Red Riding Hood story, and I thought it was fantastic. So yet again, you had to get Red Riding Hood to, I think at this point, it was get to Grandma's house. And so you had your, the, the basic goal was the same, but on the map were these foxes and bunnies, or on the sheet, right? You don't have a map yet. And what you had to do is make sure the foxes and bunnies didn't end up on the same path because the foxes would eat the bunny. And I thought that was really neat. And what was interesting in this one is it actually also used the hedge part. They could, if they were on the same forest, the fox would eat the bunny. Or if they were on the same pack, the fox would eat the bunny. So I thought that was really neat. Just as one example, and there's a ton of different ones. Now, you just keep playing until you get to the end of one story. You're going to get points on the end of every round. You add them all up, and whoever has the most points wins. Now, there is more to it. Uh, there's keys you can collect and in one chapter, and then when you're on a later chapter, it'll be a chest, and if you move over the chest, you get a random card, and that lets you break the rules in some way. Uh, there's also gems you can collect in four different colors, and there's a whole set collection element. If you collect gems of all the colors, you get bonus points. And then there's advanced rules, which I gotta admit I didn't touch. So, for example, the, the map tiles I'm talking about just have forest or clear path. Well, on the other side, they have, like, lakes and stuff. I admit I, we haven't gotten that far, so I don't even know exactly how those used. And there's some other stuff, like I said, there were two extra overlays you can add to any game. We didn't touch any of that. Yeah, it's interesting. There, I, I do see some people saying, you know, it's a fun game. It's a really great game. Uh, it would be great to find expansions for it because, yeah. again, play, again, even with two extra things, you're, you're limited on play. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm a little worried about. So at this point, we've only played full the, the one full story. I'm impressed by what I saw. Um, I love seeing games that do something new, and this definitely does. Like, I, I don't own anything like this, which is awesome. And my girls loved it. They really liked it. Little G in particular really liked it. And the other thing, uh, they, had, they had fun doing it, but the other thing I thought was cool was that I didn't seem to have an advantage over them playing this game. Like, most of the time when we're playing a board game, there's some aspect of it that I have an advantage on, right? There's math or there's strategy and tactics required or there's hand management or there's worker placement or just just stuff that by playing lots of games for many years, it gives me an edge over the kids because they're new to this stuff. Since this was just about lying down nine tiles and making a map, I didn't seem to like, I didn't seem to have any extra skill at this from playing lots of games. Like Big G actually beat me out the last time we played. Like I, I lost, I didn't even win this one. Nice. Now, replayability could be an issue. I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, we've only played through the first scenario. There are only four or five in the box, but even replaying the first scenario, like I can see it working for a while, but eventually you're going to remember which nine tiles you used. You're going to come up with an optimum solution. Yeah. I don't know, to be honest, um, I don't remember what we paid for. I don't remember the cost to know if it's justified. Component yeah. quality is really good, though. Like just seeing the transparencies are really nice. At this point, based on, like I said, one play, this isn't a full review. If you've got grade school age kids, check this out. I think they're going to have fun with it. Um, I'll let you know, though, as we get more plays in at replayability, the other aspects, what what's the deal with the other sides of the boards and the extra tiles. So right now, I find it's on Amazon.com for 35 bucks. Yeah, that's Canadian. Oh, com. Com. I could see it. it that's not, the, the, to be honest, the component quality is probably worth that much. It is. It, like, it like the gems like it are nice little gems. They're not tokens. Yeah, no, the, 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 the artwork is fantastic. You get little standees for the characters. No, they're not miniatures, but then that'd probably make it a $50 game. It does. It does look like very solid components. The art, yeah. the art is very friendly, um, you know, easily, easily viewable. Now I, I can see how there might be some viewing difficulty just because it is a very visual game. Yes. Um, so, you know, it, it wouldn't be something that I think we could, turn into a game for visual visually uh, no, disabled I, persons 
I do not think so. This is this is one Ryan in our chat will not be playing. No. But uh, but again, the pieces that are there are darn solid. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Ah, uh, well, more of the same, really. Working from home, gaming with the kids, probably, because of the runs around. I'm really hoping Deanna starts feeling better for multiple reasons. Part of that being the, the, the selfish region, so we can I can play something a little chunkier. I got to admit, I've been playing a lot of light games lately, and I could use something with some meat on it. Yeah. Indeed, I think, sadly, that's the case for most people. Just a lot of unknowns happening in the world right now. Myself, I'm hoping to get some Harry Potter games on the table nice. this weekend. Uh, either if, if, if the family wants to play, it'll be the Hogwarts battle. And if uh, it's just my son, it'll be him and I doing the defense against the dark arts. Fair. Uh, and now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Zopi, thank you. David Miller Jr. Thanks, Dave. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Colin Massey. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Although the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, be sure to tip your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the live show tonight. For those of you here, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.